people because we're really about medical services. But when you think about, for a health plan of our size, that of our $1.1 billion that we spend on medical costs, 75% of that cost is attributable to 8% of our population. So we spend about $750 million on about 30,000 patients. And many of those patients are people with really highly complex medical conditions. So people that have behavioral health issues, substance use disorder, with complex medical conditions. One example I could offer you is a 40-year-old adult male who had 161 emergency room visits in one year, which means that person's going to the emergency room three times a week, three times a week. Those are services that could be provided better in a different area, and that person could be better managed and have a better quality of life. So for the individual, there's different things that we can do, and then from the system, certainly cost savings are there. So our board um, implemented a Medi-Cal capacity grant program in 2015, through which we award grants to community organizations. We've awarded over 440 grants so far, a total of $80 million, including capital grants. And so in 2016, the board moved forward with a capital program, where we make $2.5 million available to local organizations to build um, and plan for capital projects, including permanent supportive housing, and that's really what I'm contributing to the conversation today. And so some people don't know what permanent supportive housing is. So permanent supportive housing is housing which is permanent. So as long as the resident is able to comply with the rules of the residents and make their rent payments, um, they can remain where they are. It's affordable based on that person's household income and supportive. So the tenant has access to wraparound services where they live. So for that patient that has a behavioral health use, a behavioral health condition, a substance use disorder, and a complex medical condition, at site where they reside, they can have a case manager that can make sure they get to medical appointments, that they have access to transportation, that their housing situation is stable, and on and on and on. Um, and so we find that this would be a, we, we believe that this is a really valuable opportunity for our patients. Um, and so there's two efforts currently underway. You can go to the next slide both in Monterey County, so Moongate Plaza is in Chinatown and Salinas. Um, it's being developed by MidPen. 90 total units will be built, but 20 of those will be reserved for Alliance patients with medically complex needs, and that's planned to be opened in August of 19. And then on the next slide, we also have June Day Oaks in Marina, which is a senior development, and again, 20 units reserved for um, eligible Alliance members. Um, and again, that's, that's planned to be opened in um, June of 2020. So, as I mentioned before, housing is a foundational component of health, um, which is why the Alliance has leaned into this area, and um, I'm really happy to be here to talk about this with you today. Good morning, my name is Mia Kong, and um, I'm an affordable housing developer that has built throughout California in rural communities, suburban communities, and urban communities. And a lot of my focus over the last 20 years has been infill areas. And so, as we look forward in the state of California, we are projecting 50 million people by, 20, by 2020. And where is everyone even going to go? You know, when we have fires in Sonoma that we lose 6,000 housing units and we lose 11,000 housing units in Paradise, where are folks going to go? We can't actually keep rebuilding the same patterns as we used to have. So, as an infill developer, one of the biggest challenges is really this entitlement process and asking permission from all of your neighbors if you can build this housing. And remember, these folks already have their buildings there. They're already your neighbors. And so if you say, hey, neighbor, do you want new neighbors to come in? You know, oftentimes their answer is no. So part of the challenge is how do you do the right thing? When all the policy directives say we need to grow in, we need to grow near transit, and we need to build housing for teachers, we need to build housing for supportive housing. I mean, I've, I've done all of that. But the challenge really is we've got to find more tools to actually unlock the value in the existing underutilized properties that we have in California. So Monterey, Seaside, you name it. Think about parking lots. Think about you know, single-story buildings that are you know, absolutely suburban malls that are empty now. Could those be reborn into mixed-use communities? The two, large, the two large populations that we see are growing are our senior population. We have 1,000 seniors turning 62 a, a, a day and 10,000 in the, in the U.S. that actually am the governor appointee to the California Commission on Aging. So one of the biggest issues is how are we going to get ready for the future? Not to mention we have millennial children who, guess what, are still living in your parents' house. So we've got to start making room for folks. And how are we going to do that? It's really about embracing density and reducing parking and legalizing housing in our existing communities. So what I've had to do as an affordable housing developer is pivot to the state legislature. 
So I've worked on two bills, one called AB 744 that reduces parking requirements for affordable housing, for senior housing, supportive housing, near transit, and cuts through everyone's local red tape. So it's state laws that would absolutely legalize reducing parking minimums. So you start at a parking ratio of 0.5 for senior housing or 0.3 for permanent supportive housing because parking has been a proxy for NIMBYs to say no to housing development. So that's one way we can unlock it. We'll hear later on from Senator Weiner, SB 35. These are tools that allow for buy right approval, so you don't have to go through 17 campaigns that cost a half a million dollars a piece to try to get 20 units of housing built. I mean, we've got to stop that. It's ridiculous. We've got to say it's okay to build. We have to make room, and we've got to do it. And I think Monterey and Embed can lean in that notion because we now have tools. And so you have SB 35. You have um, AB. Uh, 1621 that allows for permanent supportive housing and homeless housing to be done by right. These are tools that can be used today to unlock the land values that you have. And part of the challenge really is infrastructure dollars. So because of Prop 13, we don't have the funding to build the infrastructure. So when you have a single story McDonald's, let's say, that's now out of business and you now need to build 30 units of housing there, you now need to do sewer, water, electrical, and everything falls to you. We need funding at a larger level, the state level, to start paying for this infrastructure so we can start retrofitting these areas, so we can start making room for folks. Because when you look at 100 units to the acre, believe it or not, that can be done in four stories in wood. It all depends on unit size. We need to actually start celebrating the fact that smaller units are the solution. Not everyone needs 3,000 or 6,000 square feet to live in. You don't need five car garages to be happy. People can be happy with fewer cars in areas that are walkable. And that is the future for California because we can actually fit about 3 million people into the existing infill areas in the state today. But we need to unlock the powers that are actually controlling those forces and we need to move forward on building housing. So I've moved, I not only do housing development, but I also work in state policy and be working this year and trying to bring some new legislation forward. Thank you, Mia. And, and that's really what it's about is, um, you know, thinking not only regionally, but also at the state level, what, how we can move uh, forward. Um, we're going to pivot more toward uh, next, uh, talking specifically maybe about the next year, two years, kind of the short term for each of you. If you can think about uh, what kind of impact uh, do you want to see in that, that time horizon. Um, and we'll start specifically with Lisa. And I'm going to pick on Lisa a little bit because I got a little bit in trouble when I had to come home at 1.30 in the morning. Um, and my wife's like, okay, like, what's going on? And I was at a hearing, really. This thing went till like one in the morning in Watsonville. And I had, you know, she, she believed me, but. Uh, <laughs> but it helps it when, it when I have extra proof, right? Uh, so I, I wasn't in trouble, but um, we're fighting a good fight. And that was a really good story there. Lisa, do you want to just uh, talk to me about that and what you expect to see from your project over the next couple of years? Well, uh, um, I think. Um, First of all, I want to thank you, um, Matt, and uh, his organization for helping me go through. Um, 2018 is a big year for me. Um, my project uh, in Watsonville, 150 units, Sunshine Vista, finally got it approved. But um, we went through a huge hurdle um, between the neighbors. Um, so what happened is, uh, yeah, this project is an infill project. And uh, um, Matt, maybe you can go back to the slide that we had before. So, um, projects located in Watsonville, but this is an infill site, it's about uh, 13 acres total. But from the slide, everybody can see it was used for a junkyard. So, it was about 60 years using it as a junkyard and uh, car dismantling, you know, all those industrial use. But it was infilled in the old um, neighborhood of residential. So, um, yeah, we came in and we are going to do uh, environmental remediation costs over four to five million right now, uh, just from the developer side. And we're going to create 150 houses here. But uh, unfortunately, like Mia said, you know, when it goes to the new uh, the existing neighborhood, you, you know, you ask the neighbors, we won't have um, 150 houses there. And everybody was saying, oh, no, no way, okay. Even though it's, uh, uh, environmental problem over there, yeah. But uh, I guess um, it takes um, efforts and time to work with the neighbors and work with your city, work with your city council members. I guess my experience can share with everyone is um, you just need to go beyond and do your homework. So what we do is we actually 
uh, we to the neighbors about three or three to five times, and uh, we talk to city council member and listen to the neighborhood and do many many revision until um, you know the major satisfaction has been met. Um, yeah, I guess um, city of Washington city council give a great support. They can see the future. They see the house shortage and uh, of course we um, made uh, great efforts to uh, every neighbor um, they can heard, um, make a quiet revision as I said uh, on the plans and finally we got uh, approved um, on the uh, August 28th. Of course that was a long hearing um, all the way until uh, midnight to 30. So we got uh, quite a lot of supporters uh, all over the whole Montgomery and the Santa Cruz County because we're creating 20% affordable housing, which is 30 units, uh, which is, uh, I would believe that's the biggest affordable housing units ever in um, within the 10 years in the city of Washington and in the county. So, um, yeah, this is a great win-win, uh, and we we'll keep continue, and uh, hopefully we can start to build actually 2019, and 150 units, 150 units will be getting available to public within three to five years period. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for your leadership and investment in the community. Um, one of the things that struck me about the project was just, you know, how much cleanup is really happening that was already happened. So just, I mean, if, enough, if the worst thing happened, nothing would ever move forward. So much has already happened in terms of uh, putting this area on the path to, to being a more healthy place uh, for folks to live and, and protecting, you know, the Elkhorn Slough that obviously has connection to, to our Monterey Bay. Um, I want to pivot to, to health care. Because that, that's you know affordable housing is now becoming synonymous with with the healthcare industry and the fact that we have a major healthcare system provider here in the region taking on uh, housing directly. Um, what, tell us more about um, you know, what you expect to see over the next couple of weeks. Sure. So as I mentioned, we have the two projects that are scheduled to launch in 19 and 20, and we also have three in development um, in Santa Cruz County and in Merced County as well. And so what we're really looking to achieve is for those patients who are unhoused who have really complex conditions, that they find that placement in stable housing that allows them to stabilize those medical conditions and then move forward. Um, from a funding perspective, we anticipate investing a little over $12 million total in these projects. I think the thing that's been really compelling to us and one of the lessons that we learned was the value of partnerships across the system. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to what Dave had been talking about in his design comments. That sometimes you have to look at the problem that you're trying to solve and come out of the solution that you thought was the right one. So it's not enough for the Alliance to just build care management programs or to have a network, but we need to go a little bit beyond and push the envelope a touch to see what we can do with our community partners. If we can support the infrastructure that others are willing to do, um, and if we can put resources in that direction, it can really benefit our patients. Right? And so um, whether we take on future opportunities, we'll continue to evaluate that. But certainly those five projects could have upwards of you know, between 100 and, 100 and 200 patients um, that would be housed. Right? Significant impact, both to our providers, to our members, and to the community. Thank you very much. Um, Mia, do you want to comment on, on that? What, through your work, what, what do you expect to do over the next uh, couple of years? Um, sure. Well, we, we have, we're coming off the great success of the midterm elections, so we have now new funding at our disposal for affordable housing. Uh, this is the first bond measure we've done since Prop 1, uh, A, B, and C. So uh, Prop 1 and 2 provides $4 billion of new housing dollars that go affordable housing, and those will start to filter into programs that we've had in the past, uh, one being the TOD and the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program, both of those will pay for some infrastructure. Again, that relationship with transit is key. So as your regions are growing, think about the opportunity sites around key transit nodes and walkable communities and what neighborhoods can be walkable in the next 15 years. If you're really planning forward how your neighborhoods are gonna grow. And it's, it's like a retrofit suburbia opportunity, quite honestly. And, it's, and at the same time, you're gonna be bringing in new people that have new sales tax revenues and property taxes that will be able to help support the local jurisdictions. So part of it is, is really, as we said, partnerships and synergies. And so as we see forward, we also have funding for um, securely now what we call MHSA, which is Mental Health Service Act dollars, um, which will look at mental illness and homelessness and 
lives affordable housing. But quite honestly, from an affordable housing developer, as we move into this very specialized affordable housing world, the service gets very expensive. So as as local as, as government likes to do, you can't just take a dollar and expect you don't have to do much with it. I mean, every dollar has to actually return on multiple investments, whether it's green housing, services, affordability, you name it, and it's really expensive. So we have to start thinking about creative ways to let the housing just be the housing and all these extra Christmas ornaments we find different funding for. So like we would love to tap into, for example, um, insurance and Medi-Cal for a lot of the services that we provide. They put it on the onus of the housing developer to pay very expensive services to serve the 20 units that are permanent support housing in the project. So I think that's an unsolved problem. Um, we have a new governor who's really focused on housing production. This new governor, Governor-elect Newsom, is really going to be looking forward to building three and a half million housing units in California. Where is that going to go? It's going to go in your infill area. So that means Seaside, get ready. That means Monterey, get ready. You've got to start making housing happen within your existing core. You can't just look at fringe housing and expect that it's because it's out there in the hinterland and no one sees it, no one cares. You really need to have it up front and present and it needs to be networked. And you really need to be thinking about it in your community from 8 to 80. I've got a good friend, Gil Penalosa, who really advocates on the fact that we need to have communities that are going to serve your youngest and your oldest populations and provide equitable housing across the entire spectrum. And the only way you can do that is start building in. And so we may have some infrastructure dollars. Um, and then there's going to be new legislation. Uh, Senator Weiner's going to talk about um, a new bill that he's going to be proposing that's going to look at streamlining, again, certainty around getting housing in this bill. We all know this is the place for it. We still have challenges. We need local governments and partnerships to actually allow us to start by right zoning this housing. So there's certainty because it takes us a long time to line up the funding. So all of this is expensive, all of this can be done, but it's a long-term vision and, and we have to stick to it. And we have to pivot if we need to, we have to change if we need to, and if we have to fail if we need to. But we actually have to start doing something. It's more than just plan for it. You actually have to start building it. Thank you, Mia. And uh, the 8 to 80, I'm going to use that one too, so good. And, and so, so part of the 8 to 80 is the K to 12, and that's where uh, K comes in. Do you want to tell us about what you expect in the next year? Uh, yeah, so we're, we're trying to look at this uh, from a number of different perspectives. So um, one is uh, down payment assistance for teachers. Um, we partnered with a company called Landed that um, is essentially a shared equity model where they help teachers do down payments and then they have a percentage of the equity that you would um, sell that. And so that's big because uh, teachers are already paying an exorbitant amount for rent um, that could be used towards paying a mortgage. Um, but the hurdle is getting the down payment. So, so looking for other ways in which we can do that. Um, secondly is partnering with, uh, with the community and we've partnered with um, Midpan Habitat for Humanity and we got a grant from the United Way uh, to help support looking at four of our sites that are underutilized or not utilized and determining um, what could uh, be done in those sites in terms of housing and um, what are the, the limitations and, and whether we can do that. Um, partnering with uh, affordable housing is uh, complicated because our teachers make more money than uh, the, the limit in terms of um, with we brought the tax credit. So, so we have to kind of package the deal with serving some of our classified staff and our teachers. But it's, um, it's really kind of uncovered the situation where people are saying, oh, we have moderate income housing in this development, but our teachers make too much to qualify for that. So uh, we need to uh, look at that. Um, and then uh, third is partnering with uh, private developers. And we're in the initial kind of discussion, and we'll see what happens. But trying to de develop a model where um, you could uh, build on school property um, and then sell that to teachers uh, and then teachers would have to keep it within uh, the school community, right? So the land remains uh, part of the school district. You're not giving up the land. Um, and uh, the housing is uh, able to have a zero down payment for teachers to get in, but then in exchange, they have to sell it within the community of the certain and so trying to develop a model that would work, and then you could um, go to different places. Because we have literally hundreds of acres, um, some in the form of Fort Ord, some off of Highway 68, 
um, some kind of infill areas, the schools that have been closed, uh, the corridor closed, um, that we could develop. Um, so we, we're very land rich. We just have to find a model that works because we don't have an extra $10 million to, to put into housing. We don't have, um, we have the ability, although it would be very tenuous, to take out a loan, right? So we don't have enough money up front to make it happen. But partnering with developers, uh, could we do it? I, I think there's a win win solution. And we're going to try to unlock it. All right. So you said it two or three times now, and it just brings a smile to my face. You said land ridge. And he's talking about the Monterey Peninsula. And so um, what comes to my mind is you know, making sure that we activate those few opportunities that we have and work together uh, to remove and to mitigate the obstacles in front of us because we have those real obstacles. There is a water constraint. There is a traffic issue. There are issues uh, in terms of making sure that we have the, the right kind of development that works with the community and getting that kind of input and making that into a sensible plan wherever we, we put that. My question to the panel, and maybe we'll start back with, with me, is, you know, what kind of advice would you give to us here as a community of folks that, you know, we're accepting the challenge, we want to move forward, but let's get real, there's going to be a resistance to what we want to see done. And um, what do you see as maybe one or two key strategies along the way that we, we should be mindful of as, as we try to activate the opportunities that we have in front of us to take on housing? Well, I agree with uh, sort of as you already are doing it, and as Kate illustrated so eloquently in the beginning, it's about policy. And I think when you're dealing with local governments, it really is about can we get on the same page, whether we need to reframe it or whether we need to create the platform large enough to say if housing is so important and we've got to lift all boats, that means we need housing opportunities at every single level. And for that, that's going to give power to your local government and your planning officials and your directors to go out there and do everything they possibly can to incite that behavior. And what that means from a developer perspective is give us clarity, give us certainty. If we come to you with this one acre piece of land next to a bus stop that we could actually put 100 units on it, but it's zoned for 30, what are you going to do? Right? There are tools in the tool chest that the state has provided us, whether it be what's called density bonus law, SB 1818, my bill 8744, which is reducing parking. I mean, what, you put everything on the table and you legalize the powers that you actually have. So you have SB 35 that allows for by right zoning if your jurisdiction hasn't met their arena favors. So that means it bypasses discretionary approval. Right? Oh my God. Oh my God. You can't actually let something go through without 100 people telling you why they have a problem with it, right? Like we're so used to that same problem. But the reality is the problem is too big. We actually have to let everyone pass through the eye of the needle. They can't prove that they have to be extra special and extra shiny and extra dazzling and extra affordable housing and extra windmills and you name it, right? Because we like to dazzle people when we come in for development. But at the same time, all that's expensive. And a lot of times we dazzle because we want to win people's support. But the reality is we actually can't build it because it's too expensive, right? So we have to find ways that we look at utilizing the tools that we have. And if you're, if you're, if you're a city council member and you've got a few angry residents because, oh my god, there's going to be a three-story senior apartment building next to their housing development, you're going to say, don't blame me, blame the governor. The state of California actually says we must do this. That's all you have to do. And it works. <laughs> So these are great gifts that are being passed down to you from the state of California. All you have to do is legalize what's already been legalized at the state and use it. And get people, big and small, property owners. So we have Prop 13. One of the reasons why we have a lot of properties that sit around doing nothing is because it's Prop 13 and people are paying really low taxes. Super low taxes, right? And they don't know what to do because it's so expensive. Infrastructure, so school district, right? And all that, all that, way, all that stuff's off the rolls off the tax rolls. So if you incentivize construction of new housing, you all of a sudden have increased your tax rolls and property taxes, right? So now you have an ability to start financing some of this infrastructure and financing the things that we want today. So you have to be creative. Hopefully the new tool I'm working on at the state will provide you funding for infrastructure, performance schools, doing the right thing, and rewarding local jurisdictions for doing the right thing. So now you actually just have to go out there and legalize it and do it. All right, legalize it. 
And I think you get the marijuana thing, so I know what you're thinking about. Uh, but I, I forgot to pass my, my, I was looking for a wand this morning. And I don't know if one of my daughters must have taken it. I love that wand. But we have the magic maraca. So take it one time because she wants to legalize it. Legalize it out there. Legalize it. Shake it and then. <laughs> what's your ma what's your the magic maraca uh, thing that you would think that we we should do to take on the resistance? Well, you know, I'm going to focus on the medical space and and reiterate the point that housing is really important to people's ability to access healthcare. So if housing is a compensable medical service, which is blasphemy, and yet it would be really important that can change everything. Because you know, the point is is that we can't. There's resources available where there's needs that need to be met that uh, are narrow in scope and are just within one silo. So we have to connect to figure out what can we do for housing in the permanent supported housing space because we, it's permissible for us to pay for that. So if we could just pay for housing, if there was revenue available for that, that could change everything for our patients. Just pay for housing. I guess um, I won't talk a little bit from um, the perspective of you from a developer. Um, actually, uh, most people thinking a developer are rich, you know, the guys making evil money, you guys are just, you know, grabbing every which sense you could, you know, from the buyer. Actually, that's not exactly the truth because um, I, was, I will talk a little challenge, you know, what actually we have right now, um, especially Central Coast. Central Coast is a, a very unique market. Actually, because you're using um, the construction um, labor and you use construction material exactly from another side of the field. So you basically got exactly cost from um, San Francisco, uh, from uh, Silicon Valley. But you don't, you don't really get exactly the same uh, selling price at this point. And um, at the same time, I would say the land, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the density issue. Because, um, because everybody actually, I was most of the labor actually anti development, so you don't get the broad density you want. If you look into the uh, recent approval from Santa Cruz County and Mount Monterey County, most of the project actually, the density going down, uh, our 20 or 30 percent of the final approved. So once the developer don't get the density they want, especially going a difficult side like what I'm doing right now, you just don't. The construction cost and the labor cost is rolling up two digits every year. Within the uh, within three years, we are looking at a 25 to 35 percent up from last five years. So, how a developer is going to pencil out a project with without a density over there? So, like Mia said, we need to legalize all the density in order for a developer can spend their backyard money and put it into the project. That's, that's the key. Otherwise, there's very few developers also going to walk into the expensive uh, project and without the certainty of a density they can actually achieve. So that's something actually one developer the challenge. Of course, there's a lot more you know, uh, in this world. You know, all the rates from the conventional uh, loan has been going up, and uh, as a developer, you need to pro uh, find a private uh, placement uh, a transaction. Now, like you know, a couple of years ago. So I would say um, uh, getting the density and uh, getting legalized and getting certainty for a uh, uh, for a developer. So that is something we really want to get uh, help uh, from uh, political side, from the uh, policy maker. Yeah. A very strong vote to legalize housing density. And she's going to shake it just to make sure. <laughs> all right. Magic Maraca, you got a Magic Maraca moment here? All right, all right. Uh, so, yeah, I think that um, there's a number of emerging models. So, so one district uh, passed a, a bond, um, <coughs> facilities construction bond, 55% threshold just for teacher housing. Uh, we just passed a bond, uh, and in our initial draft, we included teacher housing in it, um, but uh, got some feedback from the Taxpayers Association that they would, they would uh, oppose it um, if that remained in, and so we, we decided to pull it out. Um, but there is a model that 
Uh, San Jose Unified is doing a model where they're closing under uh, enrolled schools and turning those into housing. Um, but they're, they got a firestorm of opposition uh, from the community. Um, so, th but that's an emerging model. Uh, so I guess my magic moment is um, developing a model that's repl replicable, uh, that does not require school districts uh, to put in things that they don't have, which is money, but requires them to put things in that they do have, which is land, um, and make it a replicable model so that you can do this um, and do it again and again in different places. I, and I, we're working on I think it's possible, so that's my... my All right, you think it's possible. Uh, I'm going to disregard what Dave Evans said earlier about these complex things and then you break down and they're not really replicable. Okay, but anyway. But we're going to continue trying, I believe, in DK. So we're going to pivot now to any qu uh, audience questions for the next uh, few minutes, because I, I see some writing in this. I know there's some questions out here for this amazing group of, of folks up here. And I see one here in, in the corner, or a couple. There you go. Hi, great panel. Thanks. I'm going to bring up a word that we haven't heard much of, water. Um, in Santa Cruz County, we have so much unincorporated land where we could do some infill with ADVs. And at least in the Soquel Creek Water District, that water hookup fee is $29,000. So it's going to take a long time to make that little tiny project cash flow, but it would provide a lot of housing. And I know the county has uh, reduced fees or eliminated fees and tried to make it a lot easier for homeowners to put an ADU on their property. But without water fee, it's still untenable. And I'm wondering if any of you have any ideas about that. Housing doesn't need any water. We're good. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, thank you for that. And actually, before I turn it over to anybody who's brave enough to, to answer a little bit of that, is we have a roundtable specifically to try to get into that. Because over the last year, every other time that we're really trying to move forward, you know, especially in the peninsula in Santa Cruz County, water is, is an issue. It's a challenge. There's allocations, all these different ways of trying to, to get that. We're going to have, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit in the, the roundtable session. I encourage you to join us. Anybody else who's interested in, in finding out more about that and participating, please join us later. Anybody want to take that off in your experience? Let me yes. just quickly say there are a lot of initiatives happening at the local level that are looking at reducing fees for ADUs as part of, um, you know, Portland has some great examples. Um, I know there are various other groups and, and you can probably just do a Google search. And so literally there are policies again that are driving towards now ordinances that are reducing ADU fees for hookups because essentially you've already paid for your hookup, you are already you already are using water so it's just another extension so there are ways to kind of build that in. Um, part of the challenge is utility agencies don't like to be told what to do and they can't charge existing ratepayers for all the things that they have to keep doing. So they stack it all up on the new guys. So the new guys have to pay forward not only what they use but all the other deficiencies that, that no one else can pay. So unfortunately, that's the life of an infill developer. We have to pay it forward, so it becomes cost prohibitive. But if that's the model, it really just comes down to, let's be creative about financing it. Let's bring more money to the table. If we need to bring more money to the table and, and give it to the you know, utility companies, let's go find some resources. And whether that's you know, tax increment, whether it's looking at value capture, whether it's other ways of doing it, you know, if, if that's part of the challenge, let's just solve it with money, and let's find new ways and creative ways to finance it. We need a magic rock of money, money magic, something. But um, real, real quick on, on this, and then I'll take a question over here uh, in the corner. Um, one thing we, we have been doing over the last year is really moving forward with uh, some, some policy uh, um, changes, particularly in Santa Cruz County and the city, uh, looking forward to adopting the, some of our recommendations around how they assess their impact fees based on square footage, not on per unit. And the best illustration is that, of that is that if you're a market rate developer, which we have folks here who have, have that experience, if, if you're paying the same fee, whether you're developing a 400 square foot studio or a 4,000 square foot home, and you're paying the same per unit fee, then you're incentivized just by that nature of that fee to build bigger, right? So just changing some of that calculation and then allowing, fewer. allowing fewer and smaller. So we want few, you know, fewer and larger. We want more and smaller, right? Which could, should equate to more affordability. So that's really baked into some of our recommendations and, and I want to thank the leadership in Santa Cruz and um, 
Santa Cruz County uh, for taking that on. There's several others that are looking to that in Salinas and Monterey County as well. We have a question over here in the corner. Is that Linda? Yes, Linda. Um, my question is to Stephanie P.K. Um, you know, we rebuild affordable housing increases in the things that we have to look across subject lines, uh, education and health, not just uh, regionally, but at the state level and at the federal level. And I really think with the new governor, we have an opportunity to think about how we, we encourage more partnerships so that we can do exactly what we've both been talking about. We actually worked with the San Jose School District and the school board couldn't bring themselves to vote to switch off the land. I think we need to come up with some policy that says it's okay to do that, that lowers the voting threshold to do this, and that really works to get some of that healthcare money into all of our collective efforts to get people off the street who are extremely frail and have a lot of issues. So I would uh, welcome your thoughts on how we might forge that membership, not just here, but at greater levels. I think that's a great question. From our perspective, one of the interests that we have in supporting these uh, permits, supporting housing projects is that with case management on site, we can measure the impact of those services being available. So we're partnering that effort. We also are offering intensive case management grants to our primary care practices right now, where our primary care providers are trying to do a better job of managing patients with really complex conditions in the absence of some of those people being housed. But there's evidence to show across the nation that when you house people, <laughs> they are able to manage their conditions better. And if they're managing their conditions better, not only are they as a human being having a better experience, but the cost to the system is much lower. And so there's a lot of health plans around the state that are also making the same efforts and trying to measure the impact. So that what we can do at the state level from a policy perspective and a funding perspective is demonstrate to the state that there is value in putting money in this area. Because rather than spending money on unnecessary inpatient stays and unnecessary emergency room department visits, we'd be spending money on preventive care and disease management and housing. And so I think a lot of us around the state are going to demonstrate that, but we're just at the beginning stages. It's going to require a lot of conversation and a lot of partnership. Um, it's something we're really emphasizing at the Alliance just in terms of reaching out, participating in MBEP and talking with employers and the school districts to try to figure out where are the touch points and our various responsibilities and how can we leverage our resources to support what others are doing. The only thing I'd add is that I, I agree completely that we need to go across boundaries. Um, and I don't know a lot about housing, but uh, I know enough to know that it's incredibly complex and that I don't have the time to figure it out. I, mean, I need experts to help. Um, and so sitting down with mid -Pen has really been uh, excellent for, for us because they, they're experts in that field and I don't want to pretend to be an expert. Um, I, I will say I do think there's an opportunity to create proof points uh, locally that then could be leveraged uh, more statewide. Um, and so the, the grant that we got from United Way, um, or, or MidPen got from United Way, um, is, is a relatively small amount of money but if, it, if that trend translates into a project that's viable, um, then that's going to have a huge impact. And so I think more locally funded um, uh, options, like a, a, as a district, I can't say to my board when I'm making cuts, can you give me an extra $50,000 to uh, try to research whether we could do housing on part of my property. That's not going to, to, to work. Um, but getting that as a grant, then it's going to allow us to do it. So I think there's strategic uh, opportunities to help local uh, partnerships uh, get off the ground. One other thought that I would add is, I think as we're looking to solve these problems, we will solve them in a better way if we think about whose problem are we solving. Am I looking to solve the alliance's problem, or am I looking to solve my patient's problem? And if I look at it from the perspective of the individual human being who, um, is just trying to live their life. The fewer silos that we make them jump through in order to have their needs met, the better experience and the better outcome they're gonna have. So at the Alliance this year, what we're talking about is it's all about the member. If it doesn't benefit our member, we're really questioning why are we doing it, and if we're all doing that in the system, it matters less what my piece is or what PK's piece is, but do we know where those touch points are for that one individual that just needs to get through life a little bit easier? All right, thank you. And we still have a few minutes for questions, and right here, David. Hi, uh, David Foster with Tower Transport and Humanity Monterey Bay. I have a question for you guys, and that's just um, the whole question about um, uh, the, the new Prop 1 money uh, coming through and its focus on uh, infill housing and on transit-oriented development housing. It seems like 
Monterey County and Santa Cruz County, I, I'm worried that we maybe are getting left out of that. And I think my solution is that we need to rename all of our bus stations BART. Um, and, and hope that that helps uh, trick them into thinking that maybe we, we qualify. Um, and I'm wondering, if there's, is there another way that we can get around that so that we can uh, say that, you know, maybe even without part, we can uh, uh, qualify for some of those funds? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, you know, I, I, I did a project up in Kings Beach, with this, which is North Lake Tahoe, very, very restrictive zoning. It was rural. We started out at seven units to the acre. The bus showed up once an hour. We got $4 million of state infill infrastructure grant dollars because the, the region was committing to 30 minute headways. And all of our sites were within 200 feet of transit. So, you know, there are different standards for different regions. And so, you know, your region would fit as long as you have what's called this infill definition, which is about 75%. Um, it's surrounded by existing uses by 75%. So say it's a parking lot or say it's, you know, a vacant piece of land or something like that, but it was already utilized, that should count under the infill definition. Um, so the, I would imagine there are properties in and around your communities that are within the existing urbanized areas. Urbanized areas could also mean unincorporated counties. So there are pockets of what we call urbanized areas that just have a high concentration of population in areas. Those are all eligible for different state funding. So I think figure out what you have, look at the rules, and start mapping, seeing what areas are opportunity areas, and then work with your partners. Say one of the opportunity areas is PK School District. You know, maybe it's by one of these transit sites that's a perfect node. Maybe it's called out in your SCS as being a transit priority area. Those are the those are your those are your low hanging fruit. Those are the ones where you it's large enough. You you know that you can attract new funding, and it's where you're going to go. And maybe then you can add the pieces of supportive housing in there, and then you go capture other dollars. We also have what's called SB2, which is our firm source. So that's going to start coming down to local levels, and they can use that for different housing programs and funding. So. There is going to be new money. It's really about getting ready and being and, and sort of getting getting your partners ready. Because really, cities can't build this housing alone. You know, we need our affordable housing partners like MidPen and Eden and you know and related and all your other good developers out there. But we need certainty and we need often land. Affordable housing is not cheap. We often need land and money to actually get it built. And so if people can start strategizing about what resources you have, what are your best sites, how are we going to leverage what we have, what little resources we have, it's like playing poker. you got to ante up. You can't start with nothing. And then you go to the state level and you start competing for funds. And then soon enough, you grow your pot of funding so that you can actually build that project. So it's really about coordination and, and lining up the resources. But your, your area should qualify. For that. And so um, right here in the
Um, my one concern that I do have is um, two words that I didn't hear was gentrification and displacement. Um, those are big issues that are facing millennials such as myself. Um, we're graduating, we're coming back home, we're living with our families. We're in student debt, we can't afford these mortgages or these payments that are happening. Um, just recently, as an example, um, in downtown Watsonville, we were really thrilled that these new studios were coming into place, only to find out that $1,950 is the cost for a studio in a community that is not making that much. So, um, I guess uh, from my perspective, how do you work with uh, millennials knowing these things and knowing that, you know, our concerns, um, just like what was stated before, is gentrification and being displaced in our very own communities. Silicon Valley is not too far away from Watsonville, and we know that they're waving a flag to them and saying, come to our location. But what that tells our people in the community is, we don't want you here, or that's what it seems like it's being said to us. So I'm curious what um, your guys' thoughts are on that. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Right. Uh, we got someone from Arsenal. Actually, I mean, <laughs> I've been asked this question for many times, and uh, um, I, I only can speak for uh, my current project right now. So what we did um, from um, from this project and my company is we're going to make good efforts, which is 30 days for local. Uh, Green City is more about city of Watsonville, or we have to say uh, Santa Cruz County. We're going to keep the 30 days. Uh, for the local marketing, and you guys have uh, priority come to buy. So, other than any investment, cash people come, uh, something. Yeah, I, that's the only, only thing I can say. Right? So let me add if you're building affordable housing and you're taking down, for example, a sixplex, let's say it's just a rotten, fallen down old apartment building and it's got a whole bunch of families living in there. As an affordable housing developer, we actually plan for the relocation of those units, whether we pay them payments or they, they also can come back. And so then you're building housing that, frankly, is better, more, you know, more sustainable oftentimes. You know, the affordable housing that folks can afford by default are, frankly, older. And oftentimes, maybe they don't work so well, right? Maybe your heat doesn't work so well. You don't have insulated windows. You know, when I did my work in Tahoe, people spent $1,000 a month on utility bills because the apartments were summer apartments with single-pane windows on an oil heat. So just because it's there and affordable doesn't mean that that's your only solution. You actually need to start rebuilding the housing stock. And by building more units, you actually have more opportunities. So if you're building affordable housing, we're working on the gentrification piece by providing new housing resources for folks that can afford it and live in the community. But at the same time, you really have to just keep building. And, and of all times, because that's really how you're going to get at some of this housing affordability. The reason why it's $1,000 a unit for that studio is because it probably costs $300 a square foot to build. It's very expensive to build new. And so there's got to be ways that we finance it and subsidize it so we can bring down those costs. It's very hard for that missing middle, those teachers and those people making over 150% of median. There's no program for you, I'm sorry. It really doesn't work. So what you really have to do is start really working with your production side, bringing more units to the table so there's more variety. So the challenge is we now, in, under the new federal guidance and the tax rules, we can actually bring our units up to 80% of AMI now in a lot of our affordable housing. So we're going to start increasing anyway some of the affordability and then balancing it out. So there is an opportunity to start reaching at the higher levels. But again, be creative. ADUs are great for the millennials. You know, build more ADUs. Just get more housing stock out there. They'll start to see prices. Love it. Come on. Thank you for that. And I also want to say that you know participation pays off, right? So get, getting you and, and your friends and, and other millennials out to these council meetings, the planning commission hearings, and other things makes a diff huge difference. And um, one of the things that's coming up across the region really over the next year or two years is folks are having to update their housing homes. There is a huge section in there about anti-displacement. This is exactly where we need to bake in the best practices, not only across the region, but across the state, to, to deal with exactly what you're talking about. We're going to take two more questions over here, and then we're going to wrap up. Esther? Hi, Esther Malkin, Monterey Peninsula, Righteous United. Uh, I wanted to just um, get your thoughts on how you guys are all talking about new development, and all of that takes time. And in the meantime, we have current renters having huge increases in their renting costs. Um, there's no real stabilization um, and no real incentive to keep um, outside investment um, from coming in and having no real um, stake in the community other than the financial aspect. 
And so while all of this new development is really important and great that it has so much support, I kind of represent more the people who do fall through the cracks that you were mentioning a minute ago. And they can't really wait for five to 10 years for new development to happen and still be able to afford living here and have their rent increase hundreds of dollars every year or six months. So I'm, I'm just curious if there's any way that you guys can participate in pressuring the, the powers that be to somehow help the gap in between when this new development happens and the people who are dealing with the issue on a daily basis now and can't really wait that long. Thank you, Esther. And, you know, and it is a tough question because uh, that's really what people are feeling and, and seeing a lot in, in our field. Um, a lot of our MBEPS uh, initiative is about new supply, right? So that's where we have a laser focus on everything. That's not to say that we're not supportive of other policies that need to happen in order to protect existing renters and elsewhere. But again, our, our partnership efforts and our time is spent over here. So we'd love to continue working with the council members, uh, planning commissioners, and others that are interested in trying to, to work on these other issues and trying to get the right people at the right uh, table to uh, move forward on that. But, so I look forward to working with Esther and, and others on, on that uh, to the extent possible. One more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Super, super, super quick, we're at time. So I'm just um, motivated by the Dave Evans, who invited us to think creatively. So I want to throw out there, I don't know if people are aware that in Texas, there's a nonprofit 3D printing houses for under ten thousand dollars. So I just want to hold that thought. <laughs> okay, well we'll leave on that inspiring note. I think um, we're going to wrap up now. Matt, thank you so much for such great panel. You guys probably all know that acronym. Uh, there's about 10,430 housing units required in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And of these, 4,055 are low and very low income, and 6,275 are moderate and above moderate income. So what this chart shows of the number of units by basically water jurisdiction, um, kind of down the coast. And it comprises six, just under 6,400 units of housing the water uh, agencies have to face. Well, that equates to about 1,000 to 1,300 acre feet of new supply that's required to meet that need. And as you may know, uh, even the legislature, welcome, Mayor. I love all the newly minted folks in town. <laughs> um, you know, even the legislature recognized the need for affordable housing with what, what I call their um, uh, auxiliary, auxiliary dwelling unit, ADU, bill that passed in 2016. Um, that was SB 1069 sponsored by Senator, Senator Wykowski, which is interesting because in addition to using parking standards for ADUs, it also said that you don't need a separate meter, a separate connection, a separate account. It can be master metered through the, the main property, and it also waived all connection fees. So what they're trying to do is ease housing in, affordable housing in, at least through the second in that case. So with that, I think um, one of the things we want to talk about are the challenges. Now, on the back of the page, and I know that Kate and Matt want me to be really upbeat and tell you everything is possible. Michael, come on in. 
Um, I'm, here yeah. to mark, I'm here to mark it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's all unicorns and rainbows. Um, but frankly, working away from north to south, Santa Cruz is water supply constrained. Um, they rationed in recent years. They canceled the proposed desalination <coughs> plan. A citizens panel called the Water Supply Advisory Committee. Soquel Creek Water District is also water constrained. Um, they have formally declared a groundwater emergency. They protected seawater intrusion. Um, they are in overdraft. The city of Salinas is 100% uh, dependent on groundwater. The basin is in severe overdraft and is going to be subject to the water, the groundwater sustainability plan under, the, uh, under Sigma. Marina Coast Water District is uh, receiving outside challenges to its water supply assessment as it relates to new development, especially on Fort Ord, where they have a contested 6,600 acre feet of water, which has not been demonstrated to be uh, sustainable yield. On the Monterey Peninsula, the Calam surface water supplies are subject to a state cease and desist order, which is interesting because in the AMBEC housing allocation study, they actually noted that that cease and desist order limits the, the number of housing units that could be allocated to Pacific Grove, Monterey, and Carmel. And they basically took those out of their housing assignment and gave them to the city of Marina because they said that the commute was easier from there than it was from the city of Salinas. So maybe later we'll get into the trade-offs between traffic and housing and water. We, uh, on the Monterey Peninsula, we also have a groundwater adjudication from 2006. So those in combination have reduced supplies that are currently available. And the jurisdictions are running out of water to allocate to new housing. And the desalination plan that is supposedly the final uh, solution is now subject to two lawsuits. So we're looking for creative solutions in the interim. We're certainly expecting that there will be new water supply alternatives uh, proposed to fill the gap. That's what the Citizens Panel in Santa Cruz has proposed. And this year, or this coming year, early 2019, the city is supposed to act on those proposals. It includes recycling, it includes conservation, it includes <coughs> Interbasin transfers from Scotts Valley or Soquel Creek. I just mentioned Soquel Creek is constrained, so it's not really uh, availability. A conservation offset program to maintain water neutrality, the Soquel Creek Water District says, hey, a developer can come in and develop if they can demonstrate savings elsewhere to offset the new water need so you remain water neutral. Water credits and transfers is something our agency does in order to enable property to continue to build if you can demonstrate that there's a source of water or permanent abandonment of other water use. And small local water projects, uh, we've also seen those on the Monterey Peninsula that fill an interim need but don't meet the long-term demand. So those 6,400 housing units that are required for all these water agencies will require large-scale projects, but the small-scale projects do have the impact of enabling some development. We recently saw uh, opening of a mid pen housing project in the city of Monterey, which was done with some creative swapping of water credits across the town. So with that, I want to introduce our esteemed panel, and we'll get into some of these issues. And going first will be uh, Mayor Bruce Delgado. Bruce was just reelected again on November 6th, his sixth term. This one, a four-year term as mayor of the city of Marina. He's been serving on the Central Coast Regional Water Board since 2011 and is chair of the board of directors of the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. Mayor Delgado believes we must intelligently manage our transportation network, groundwater, land use planning, waste and consumption, and rivers and open space in order to succeed in affordable housing. And one thing you might not know about Bruce is he's a botanist and a natural land manager for the Bureau of Land Management. Probably knows Fort Ord better than most any of us in this room. It's beautiful. <laughs> Our second speaker is Alfred Diaz Infante, uh, born and raised in Salinas. He's worked in the Community Housing Improvement Systems and Planning Association, Inc., for the last 26 years. And he also served on the Monterey County Planning Commission and has been involved in land use plannings and housing policies for almost three decades. He's a former president of the Hartford College Foundation and has served the Community Foundation for Monterey County and other nonprofits. And then wrapping up would be Sarah Hargrave. So Sarah 
you know, she doesn't have any hobbies. She says, affordable housing and water resources management have been the two most important issues throughout her career. And with housing, she served on the Monterey County Housing Advisory Committee from 2006 to 2012 as a District 4 appointee, as well as worked on general housing plan elements for Monterey County and the city of Pacific Pro. On the waterfront, Sarah has been involved with a number of water projects and regional programs, including developing the initial concept proposal for the Pacific Road Local Water Project, which, by the way, is what we call a local water project, a small-scale water project, one of those that I mentioned earlier, that frees up some water to do some projects. And the Monterey Regional Stormwater Management Program, and most recently, the Carmel River Floodplain Restoration and Environmental Enhancement Project, or Carmel River Free. And on a personal note, she enjoys the splendor of Monterey County's rugged coastline. I love the way you wrote this. <laughs> and various microclimates by getting outside as often as possible, except yesterday, I'm sure. <laughs> so with that, um, we'll turn it over to the mayor to kind of set the stage and we'll go on through. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. It uh, seems like to be intractable uh, concepts of trying to get uh, Sufficient water supply at the same time, affordable housing. Uh, so I'm just glad you're here and you're all interested. And hopefully we can work together to make things better in those, in those regards. So I wanted to start out by saying that something we all know, that Monterey Bay is world famous. It's popular with people over much of California for second homes, investment homes, retirement homes, homes for families. And these different buying groups will continue to compete and drive up housing prices so that the diverse population that we say that we appreciate uh, will become homogeneous due to gentrification under ever-rising housing costs. And uh, that's something that's uh, just a, a tough issue. Another problem is commute time. When workers have to come from Los Banos or Soledad to be in the Monterey area for their jobs, and then their lives are disrupted and their daily commute time uh, really takes a bite out of their life and it makes our scarce housing close to job centers become even more unaffordable because of that demand for it. Another problem as I see it is that we in this area are seven cities from Marina to Carmel totaling about 110,000 people. We have seven police departments, seven fire departments, seven, seven city councils serving 50,000 less people than the city of Salinas. This causes a competitive scramble between the cities for hotels, theaters, businesses, and money. Fort Ordway's authority is a joint powers authority created by the state of California to redevelop former Fort Ord. But its member city representatives are constantly jockeying to use Fort Ordway's authority to benefit their respective cities. Oftentimes in a win-lose, zero-sum game, against the other cities on the same board. This form of politics is divisive and cannibalistic, but it doesn't have to be this way, and no other JPA in our area functions like this. The ego of the cities, or whatever stands in the way of merging cities, needs to be addressed. One of the seven cities has less than 300 residents, another less than 1,500 residents. This results in a skewed governance, and too many cities in our area make affordable housing, uh, such some cities don't seem to build any affordable housing, and water management, note that the current city versus city battle over finding a desal plant for the peninsula are less likely to be successful because of this skewed government and this sort of diverse, di di divisive uh, reality. As far as solutions, uh, <coughs> In Marina, in 2012, we passed rent control for mobile home parks. Immediately, 400 families had some economic security they hadn't had before. That was 2012. In 2015, we spent $35 million to purchase the remaining title to 550 residential units, which we put immediately under rent control. In both cases, the rent control is working well with no complaints. And I think that although rent control can be an ugly and messy and imperfect reality, uh, continuing to drive the working class that we say we cherish out of our area is uh, uglier 
than that, and it's not in our social or economic interest. About a week ago, the city of Marina approved construction of a 56 unit, a 71 unit, and an 11 unit residential project, infill projects in downtown and on former Fort Ord, which between them have a substantial uh, percentage of state affordable housing designated units, as well as the rest of them, almost all of them being affordable by design. That is single, single bedroom, less than 1,300 square feet, uh, so very likely to be a lot less expensive than the other housing types that seem to be built a lot around our area. Marina can't afford to build and can't technically or feasibly build enough housing, like I just mentioned, to satisfy a seemingly insatiable demand for housing in our area that spans from San Francisco, Oakland area through San Jose and across Monterey County. Uh, I note this nice graphic that Dave passed out says that our area we, has a demand of 1300, has a requirement of 1,308 units. So if we just approved 140 uh, a week ago, Sarah told me, hey, we're 10% of the way there. Um, so we have a ways to go. But when you look at the size of our area that's required to build 1,300 units, and you look at the much larger size of the Monterey Peninsula that's required to build even less units, you can see the discrepancy involved. 1,308 for a smaller area versus 1,271 for a much larger area. Uh, so, of course, others from outside Marina would like Marina to satisfy the regional housing demand, but they don't understand that we're already economically disadvantaged because we've been a bedroom community our entire existence. So the more units we build for residential, the downward spiral economically would continue. So there's a, not a one-size-fits-all, and uh, we're not too enamored with the fact that we're being forced to build so many residential units and watch ourselves go further in decline trying to provide services, fire, police, street, parks, uh, etc., sidewalks to these people in our town. Moving on to water, publicly owned water systems is one of those solutions that I think we're looking for and a priority on recycled water before the more expensive desalinated water. Currently, the highest water costs in the nation are found in the Monterey area, and they're about to go much higher because of a proposed desal plant that will only serve one water district. And it's a for-profit system. This doesn't bode well for affordable housing or housing or affordable water. And the solution would be using all available non-desal water sources first, then building a truly regional desal plant, not one water district. You can see the water districts here that are all having similar problems. If each builds their own desal plant, what kind of economy of scale is that? What kind of collaboration is that? So uh, desal last because it's the least affordable, and we should not be having for-profit water districts. We should be having not-for-profit water districts working together for better affordability. <laughs> The driving question to this panel is, uh, with, that, with water in short supply and population increasing, is there an overall policy framework on which to base housing decisions? And I would uh, su suggest that the framework would be to build according to city-centered growth instead of leapfrog developments into open space, which are outside of towns, and provide water so solutions such that there are not winners and losers resulting between the cities. Examples, and then I'll end with these three. In 2012, there was a larger regional, truly regional desal plan about to be built in this area, but private and hometown interests torpedoed that, and now what we have is litigation uh, being the way of the water uh, process. In 2015, the city of Monterey gave the city of Marina interests, $450,000 for affordable housing for homeless veterans to be built in the city of Marina. We, the city of Marina, are going to spend a lot more than $500,000 over time serving this community's police, fire, streets, and social services, but this partnership is a good start of an example of a policy framework <coughs> whereby cities would collaboratively work together to solve the same problems we all share. 
Lastly, since 2000, the city of Marina has redeveloped a lot of inner city housing with an, within an urban growth boundary, while another city nearby spent many years and dollars toward failure trying to build leapfrog sprawl in Oak Woodland. And so we can see that a policy framework, if it took advantage of uh, past successes and failures and some intelligent policies, uh, can lead to solutions, especially if we were to work together across city uh, boundaries. Now we know why some people are passionate enough to run for mayor and others. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, Mayor Delgado should have gone last. <laughs> um, <laughs> he didn't propose it, honestly. I mean, he mentioned it to me. But uh, Dave, thank you for that introduction. Um, when you mentioned I've been doing this work for three decades. I thought, wow, if my kids were in the audience, would have said, wow, Dad, you're really old. <laughs> um, uh, but I have been doing this for quite some time. I, I was asked by Kate Roberts to uh, talk about my experience engaging in this subject. Uh, first of all, I want to thank MBAP for uh, bringing these two subjects together, housing and water. Um, because both are really critical. Um, my expertise is in affordable housing. Um, we do get involved with water because we have to. I started, uh, my engagement in this issue really started back in uh, 1992. As Dave mentioned, I served on the Monterey County Planning Commission and served there for five years. And um, that's when I realized, wow, um, what I learned in school, because I went down to graduate school and I learned uh, uh, land use economics and um, real estate development before. I'm, Got my educational background, but my, my experience and background about how things really work in local government was here at, at the County Planning Commission. And uh, one of the things that I learned is that uh, we have the police power with respect to land use decisions. This is what uh, I believe Senator um, uh, Wiener talked about is it's in the hands of local government. And But I tell people uh, in, in, in the community that that's a great thing because uh, the people that are making the decisions with respect to housing, you know, housing our, our kids, housing our, our grandkids, they're the people that you're going to see at the local uh, supermarkets, the grocery stores, or the, the, the pharmacies. Uh, so one, that's, that's a great thing. So I learned that was really important, that we can actually have a lot of influence at the local level because the people that make those decisions are people like Bruce Delgado. Um, so I spent five years on the, on the planning commission, and uh, I knew what was coming up was going to really just take a lot of my time as the president and CEO of Chief Spray Rose, I, I, I need to uh, step off because um, the big thing that was coming forward was the county general plan update. And uh, that was our plan for the next 20 years, how we're we going to grow. And uh, I can't believe it, but I had spent more than 10 years working on that general plan update. Um, I was asked to be on um, what the county board of supervisors uh, formed was it called the refinement group. They came out with, with the draft, I think it was like GP3, draft number three. And then uh, there were a number of interest groups that were um, dissatisfied with the outcome of that general plan. And uh, so the county board of supervisors decided to create this refinement group. Um, we had people representing different uh, industries throughout Monterey County, from agriculture to labor, to farmer advocates, affordable housing advocates, the environmental community. Uh, you name it, we had representation. I can't remember how many people we had. We had about 25 people. Um, again, a great learning experience for me. It really allowed me to understand the different interests of all the groups that are represented in our county. Um, and, and then I really learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned was, um, and I really at that time didn't know much about water, but with all the farmers in the room, man, they, they know a lot about water. And so as, as well as environmentalists. But, um, it's quite an experience for me. Um, I remember when we were in the refinement group, one time uh, there were some folks who were saying, hey Alfred, you know, uh, if we can get to some land, um, middle farmland, uh, could you build some farm for housing? And I said, well, that sounds great, because you know, if we can get land at a reasonable price, you know, it'd be great. But uh, the fact is that infrastructure is really critical. We can't just pop up you know, 100 units of farm for housing, affordable housing in the middle of nowhere. We really need to be close to uh, services. So infrastructure is really, really critical in order for us to build what we do. And um, I know that uh, Mayor Delgado referenced this, uh, the city set of growth strategies, and, and that's what was negotiated between the cities and the county, that there would be this um, strategy to develop, or the growth would take place 
where the infrastructure is located. Because, in fact, many of the funding sources that we use, uh, the, the affordable housing developers, uh, we have to compete for funds that basically require that, our, that when we build something that's going to be close to services. They right? talk about services, not just the infrastructure, because it costs a lot to bring that infrastructure. Um, but being close to schools, parks, uh, grocery stores, pharmacies, and so forth, what people need on a daily basis. Um, so one of the challenges, though, that, that we see and often have experienced is just the lack of infrastructure. And, um, and one of the things that we become more involved with is supporting infrastructure measures or propositions. And uh, you know, one of my, my board chairs here in, in, in sitting in front of me, Mike uh, Garcia, who uh, works for Driscoll's, and I had to go to my board and say, you know what, we, we uh, would like, I'd like to ask you to have us uh, support certain measures and propositions that really um, don't have to do with anything with housing. But as an example, we supported Measure X, which was on the ballot on November 2016, which was a transportation uh, measure. And um, so I had to explain to our board why we were supporting uh, transportation measures. Um, this last um, um, election, there was Proposition 3, which was the water bond. Unfortunately, it failed by like one or two percentage points. But I had to go to my board and explain to him why uh, it was important for Chispa to support a Proposition 3. And within the close to $9 billion in that uh, proposition, uh, there were some funds that were set aside for disadvantaged communities. Uh, Chispa has their own uh, site down in uh, San Lucas. Um, there's a lot of water there. Problem with the water, it's not the best water. Uh, so the uh, proposition would have provided funding for disadvantaged communities such as San Lucas for something like that. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the um, <clears throat> comments here in the title of today's uh, roundtable discussion talks about you know, how do we create enough housing for our um, population growth. And I remember during the refinement group um, discussions, and, and I have been interviewed by reporters and offered, you know, how do we plan for all this growth. I said, what do you mean all this growth? Does it, have you looked at what our population growth has been over the last 10 years? It's like 10 years ago. In fact, then our population growth has been about maybe 1%. I looked recently, last night I was on the internet, and the last five or 10 years it's been less than 1% growth in terms of population. And I said, that allows us to do some great planning. When you, when you have a very steady growth, then you can plan for your infrastructure, water, transportation, schools, and you can plan for, for housing. So it's not like we have major peaks and valleys. So we have a very steady growth in terms of population, so that means that we can do some really great planning. Um, the challenge is getting us all together, all the different special districts that exist. Um, I work mostly with local governments, the planning commission, city council, board of supervisors, but I find myself having to work more and being in front of special districts, whether it's the Rio Coast Water Management District or some other uh, district, and trying to get them to understand why housing is important. Um, I really haven't done this research, but after listening to um, some of the speakers this morning, I thought one of the things that we probably need to spend more time is understanding the policies of the different special districts. The County Health Department, for example, in the last few years has been advocating for including and a couple of uh, general plans, the city of Salinas and the city of Gonzales adopted a health and all policies um, um, elements within their general plan. What I thought is, well, maybe a solution should be we start advocating for housing and all policies with this, within some of these plans that special districts have. So like the water district, you know, what kind of policies do they have with respect to housing? I don't know, to be honest with you. The reason I don't know is I really just don't have the capacity to do that kind of work. That's why we've been very um, um, supportive of the work that MBEP is doing because um, it's really a challenge for us to attend the number of city council meetings that we that exist or, or plan to miss hearings. And having an organization like MBEP bringing this to the forefront has really, really been important for us. And I hope that MBEP will continue to do that work and hope we can look at some potential solutions that will include. Um, housing policies within all these special districts. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Mayor Delgado. Um, so it's, uh, I was invited onto this panel to provide an environmental perspective, and, and I think that 
as Dave mentioned, I, I've had a number of experiences that I think give me a, a broader perspective than just simply representing an environmental organization. Um, but I'll start by saying that water is not an infinite resource, and the limits that we have on our water supplies are real. I think that Dave has pointed out um, that in, up and down from north to south on the Monterey Bay, there are, there are real constraints on our water supplies. And you know when the Carmel River bed is dry eight or 10 miles inland in the late summer months, um, that water basin is over pumped. And when seawater intrusion is as far inland as it is in the Salinas Valley, that's, those aquifers are also over pumped. So I think we can all agree on the fact that we do have limited water supplies. And it, with um, Senator Weiner made a couple comments about the state of California and how it's dealing with its water supplies. But usually when people think about California, they're thinking about the statewide water systems, the federal water project and the state water project. On the Monterey Bay, we are entirely dependent on our local water supplies. So we can't rely on any state solutions to our water problems. Um, but that doesn't diminish the fact that affordable housing is also very much in short supply. And so one, uh, important policy step that I think we can all advocate for with our local government land use agencies is that when new uh, water supplies do come online, when um, the cities or county are granted water allocations that they can then choose to use um, for new development, that affordable housing should be the highest priority land use for that water. And I am a strong advocate for that. Um, I, uh, and we were, this panel was billed as being focused on water supply, but it's been mentioned um, earlier in the day and, and by my colleagues here that wastewater and drainage infrastructure are just as important when we think about our overall water infrastructure. Um, so limited sewer services um, can be a significant barrier to new housing. I think that was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, when we don't have adequate water and drainage infrastructure, there are un unintended consequences for sanitation and public health. So I see um, so all aspects of our water infrastructure as, as important, not just the water supply piece. Um, affordable housing is often cited in places where land is cheap, um, but it's usually cheap for a reason. And so one example of this where housing has been allowed to be built in an inappropriate place um, is at the mouth of Carmel Valley and, and the Mission Fields neighborhood. Um, I'm cur currently working on a project that's focused on flood control uh, for the mouth of the valley. And so the Mission Fields homes are relatively less expensive than other parts of um, the Carmel area, but they're they're less expensive because they're at significant risk of flooding. And they were built in the 100-year floodplain. So affordable housing needs to be put in the right place. And the availability of water, sewer, and storm drainage infrastructure are really key considerations to that. And so Mayor Delgado brought up something that I wanted to touch on as, as well, which is that I think the challenges we have with water and housing are really exasperated by the complexity of our governance structures. Uh, we have multiple special districts charged with water and wastewater services. Um, with the history of those agencies being at odds with the city and the county as the land use jurisdictions, um, it's not just organized citizens who are suing, um, but these agencies have more than a few times sued each other. And this is really added, I think, in some, t in some cases to the complexity of our, of our water situation. One example I would give of this is the Seaside Groundwater Basin adjudication, where uh, several cities and private landowners with wells in the Seaside Groundwater Basin sued CalAM um, in order to adjudicate that basin. However, that lawsuit was really driven by a distrust of the water management district. <laughs> and that you know added a whole layer of complexity onto how, um, what, how our water supply solutions need to be developed because now there are very strict 
um, uh, parameters put in place for the Seaside Basin. And we hear a lot about the Carmel River because of the cease and desist order, but that's as much a part of the puzzle as, as anything. Uh, we have five cities on the Monterey Peninsula within a contiguous urbanized area. And as, as Bruce mentioned, that means we're paying five city managers, five police chiefs, five fire chiefs. Um, and so while there's an appearance of small government, um, collectively that adds up to a lot of government. And, um, and what I've experienced in a number of different roles where I've participated at, at the staff level in multi-city um, regional efforts is that there are real in, in um, there are real um, inequities across the cities. Some cities really have a lot more uh, ability to deal with their problems. The city of Monterey is the only jurisdiction in the entire county that has a stormwater utility and um, stormwater management is a, is a critical infrastructure requirement that the regional board has placed on the cities. And, um, but there isn't a way to fund it. So we need to be able to really look at how, not just to, um, not just to manage our programs regionally, but to really look at how to share in our services. And so one really successful example that I would give in terms of shared, uh, shared service arrangement that is really a benefit to the, the building community and, um, is the shared building official between the cities of Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel, um, I don't know if Carmel is in there at the moment, um, Delray Oaks and Sand City. And so uh, when I was working follow up on Bruce's comment about gray water, and, you know, send your laundry water to your yard, because something came up recently in a discussion on the integrated water management plan that I've been helping the district with, um, that the, the Carmel Area Wastewater District was concerned about a, a policy statement about water conservation for gray water coupled with water recycling. Because our two largest uh, wastewater treatment plants in the Monterey Peninsula are dependent on us sending that water into the sewer system. So they're not necessarily, if we're gonna be relying more and more on recycled water, it also prevents some issues for the water conservation efforts around gray water. And so I just wanted to raise that because if we're gonna be relying more and more on recycled water, we also have to kind of reevaluate how we're doing water conservation and what approaches we're using. I, I have a question for Mayor Gilbert and the rest of you. I thought you were eloquent in identifying the lack of cooperation, historically, the lack of cooperation between the seven cities that uh, our problems are regional, <clears throat> the ones we're addressing in the East and not isolated in one of the seven cities. And I wonder what you think can be done about that. Because if that is the absolute underlying root cause of our difficulty in making progress, um, we should be talking about how to fix that. So the uh, question is, what do we do about seven relatively small cities competing when the residents move between those cities fairly fluidly for uh, home ownership, jobs, transportation, entertainment, et cetera. Um, it'll never happen unless, uh, that is uh, better cooperation, better consolidation, won't happen unless the citizens uh, demand it, right? That's where that power is gonna go because uh, elected officials bend where the wind blows, especially when you have to get a majority of them to go a certain direction. Uh, we just saw Measure J, you know, a, a significant example of people power over big money, and, and that's what it takes to do uh, to make the progress in tough issues. Sir, sir, I know that was one of your issues as well. So I, I would give an example um, from the city of Pacific Grove, uh, which recently um, opposed the county's approval of the Pebble Beach affordable housing project on the boundary of the city of Pacific Grove. And there were neighbors that were really opposed to that project. They viewed that Pebble Beach property as, as part of their neighborhood, even though it, it didn't belong to them. And, you know, I have my own view of it. I didn't work for the city at the time. Um, I supported that project. 
on the County Housing Advisory Committee. And I think it's going to take elected officials being willing to hear the concerns of those kind of neighbors, acknowledge the nimbyism, and say, you know, we're part of a region. We have job, you know, we need to be able to have places to live, for people to live who work in our communities in a different type of housing. And so I, I think that um, the, the City of Pacific Grove officials really sort of swayed with the winds because those were very loud voices and the County Board of Supervisors saw the regional picture. And so it's gonna take leadership that's really hard for the people in elected office. And for those of you familiar with that project, it also calls into question the proximity to infrastructure and to shops and homes. I mean, there's pros and cons. So, hi, my name is Esther Malkin, and I represent Monterey Peninsula Arches United, and I work really closely with Matt and the MBED group. I want to kind of, uh, I have a question, but I want to talk to the point that you guys are saying about these seven cities not meshing together. Before the election, there are, uh, were five councilmen, uh, five candidates that were running that committed to doing exactly what you guys are saying, that address this issue as a region. We have four of them present here right now. If you guys want to stand up, just go to the <laughs> Seriously, because it's important that, that Dion is one here. Yeah. I mean, these guys have committed to addressing the problems that we are talking about here, specifically as a region. And you know, you guys are just talking mm -hmm. about how everybody's been going through this as individual cities, but these guys committed to, whether they were elected or not, to address it as a region. So I highly encourage you to touch base with them. We do actually need some representation from Marina, but we have BG represented, Seaside, Monterey, Del Rios. And it's an important um, tool for, for this exact conversation to start being tapped into because they are committed to advocating for certain projects and different things that, that are going to fall under the region instead of all the so I just wanted to mention that because I think it's important that everybody know that they exist and try and work with them. So my, my question is um, uh, maybe to Bruce because Monterey has a small pocket of land up in Fort Worth that has no infrastructure whatsoever. And we are, you know, the city has been looking to that as the only place to make a real dent in affordable housing. We get five units here, three units there, eight units. It took 12 years to get 18 senior units, you know, done. So is there a way to, because Marina has already established a water, you know, scenario in Fort Worth, to share or help Monterey be able to build the infrastructure needed or, what, or connect into the infrastructure that's already there to be able to do something like that? And, and as far as the water board goes, I, I'm not sure what the parameters are to dig wells individually, but in Monterey, we have residential and commercial wells being dug regularly. And as long as they get permitted properly, it's a free-for-all. So why can't that be done in other locations? At what point do we stop that because it becomes, you know, the peninsula becomes a Swiss cheese and, you know, so there, there's actually three undercurrents to your question. Um, as far as the well thing goes, there's a Belgian brewer who's sunk two wells down off Cannery Road, and I was like, so there is a little bit of a, a lot of west going on. Um, is that legal? I mean, is it? Yeah, it's legal. It's county uh, public health and coastal <sighs> commission legal. But um, so in Monterey's piece, you actually open again the door between open space and urban core location. You know, there's a lot of mixed use residential projects that want to happen in downtown Monterey. Can't. Marina Coast Water District will issue a will serve letter for Fort Ord area, which begs a question that I'd like the whole group to answer, which is if somebody came in with a 60 unit affordable housing plan that needs 10 acre feet of water, and you know that the water supply is constrained or maybe not proven sustainable, <coughs> should we wink? and let the affordable housing move forward because 10 acre feet on a 10,000 acre feet or 10 acre feet on 4,000 acre feet of supply is not that big a number. At what point do you continue to fight 
commercial development over a lack of water supply, but do you make an exception for affordable housing, especially if you're an affordable housing advocate? I'd love to hear some thoughts on that from the crowd. But as for you, that piece of Monterey would be served by Marina Coast Water District. And so if they came forward and said, here's your will serve letter, go ahead and build. Who would pay for the infrastructure, though? Because there's all that question with yep. Fora and, you know, and, that, and so the wells. Why not dig a bunch of wells up there? If there it is so oh, wild. Yeah. So that region, just for all of you to know, is the worst well drilling location pretty much. And it sits on top of the Seaside Basin, which is adjudicated, so you can't necessarily go in as a new user. So you have to move some water around in the system. But as a Fora representative, Mayor, do you have any comment on, on that? Uh, not a floor representative, oh. Oh. but uh, but you have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say yes. If, if if Monterey wanted to build an affordable housing complex and needed the water, it's we shouldn't worry about when do we draw the line when we're so far to the other extreme of lacking so much housing. So if there's a few 10 unit, 20, 30 unit developments that want to happen and need creativity on the water supply, then we should find that creativity worry about that line when we get anywhere close to it. <laughs> so you're on record saying it now. <laughs> okay, let's go over here. Yes, uh, Watsonville uses the, uh, has a lot of groundwater. Yeah. However, it's getting heated. Uh, we're not at a limited stage here. And the question that I've asked about uh, public work is in terms of stormwater management. Why yeah. don't we use that stormwater to refurbish our groundwater, and the answer has always been we have a lack of storage. And so I'm wondering if there's some best practices in terms of stop stormwater management. So the question was, are there best practices? And what you'll see pretty much in every approved new housing development is stormwater management on site. The regs are starting to shift to bioswales and what have you. The issue there is it doesn't make it usable. It just makes it return to the aquifer. So to the extent you have some wells and, um, or you've got a groundwater source that's been recharged, that's good. The problem with stormwater is it's episodic. Yesterday would have been a great day for some stormwater, and uh, it's very expensive to build storage to build a reservoir to capture it. And so I think the movement to keeping rainwater on site, using it to recharge uh, less impermeable surface is the way to go, but generally speaking, it's going to be the last and hardest piece of water supply to crack is a line of storage. Can I answer that? Yep. So I'm not sure what's happening in, in Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley Integrated Regional Water Management area, but in the greater Monterey area and on the Monterey Peninsula, there are new, re um, new requirements for stormwater resource plans that for any project that looks to capture and reuse stormwater, you have to be part of this plan. And the peninsula area just completed that effort. And just to um, reaffirm Dave's point, in, that was a very holistic look that the regional stormwater program did, looking at what are the opportunities to actually capture and reuse storm, stormwater. And there are some opportunities and there are some examples of that on the Monterey Peninsula, but the quantities of those, of those projects are very small. So there wasn't any project that was more than 50 acre feet, 100 acre feet that could actually be generated out of a stormwater capture project. So when you take a really hard look at it, um, it's a limited opportunity. I can tell you that Pajaro gets more money in the integrated waste, uh, the integrated water management plan allocations than we do. So you got that. I have um, to tell a funny story real yeah, quick. Okay. Yeah. Dave was just talking about how today's modern laws make you contain all of your runoff water on site. Mm -hmm. So I was driving up Lapis Road north of Marina heading to the Waste Management District where our landfill is. And the strawberry fields have all of their drainage pipes emptying their water onto the county road to get it off <laughs> their crops. Considering, you know, all the pesticides and herbs and fertilizers and all that discharge going right onto the road. And they were creating a stormwater retention pond 
where the road made a dip. It was just coming all the time. So it's like, that's reality. It's and, and all that plastic is impermeable, so you think, you know, right. that we are, you could recharge the, the groundwater, but you can't. We're, we're going to go back here. And by the way, an acre foot, for those of you who aren't water savvy, is like a football field with a foot of water on it. And it serves about five to six single family homes for an entire year. So that's when we start talking acre feet, that's what we're talking about. But there's a lot to be done. And the cool thing about new housing projects is they have the opportunity to integrate best practices like big friendly gardening, um, dual plumbing. So we can't really use rainwater well for landscape irrigation, which, as was mentioned, is the biggest use. But it can now be used for toilet flushing, dishwashing, and laundry, which are also pretty large uses. So that's one way to keep it out of being stormwater, put it to a use um, in the urban setting. Um, and, and then I. The, the challenge is that water as a utility, as a resource is so cheap that the return on investment for some of these projects is 300 years in some cases for a running water system based on your utility savings. And so I think another challenge that would be great for the state to figure out, and I'm just amazed they haven't done this already, is rejiggering how water utilities can do their pricing. Because what happens is a developer comes in, even if they can develop it, they find the water savings, because they've got to go out and do all the really expensive water saving measures on other properties to free up the water to develop their project, or they have to pay for all the upgrades and the infrastructure. And water districts can neither put in, they can do some level of putting in pricing that incentivizes lower use, um, but only to an extent, and they can't share the cost for this community benefit of water for certain new projects across the range. So somebody, we have to start either, we have to start finding a way to make it more cost effective to do these water conservation measures, but new development is actually the easiest place to do that. So I think all housing projects in the region should really have a best practices toolkit to be, implement all the good lessons learned that we have in the region. I, can I respond to that real quick? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to point out with respect to uh, best practices of affordable housing is that uh, a lot of the funding that we use for affordable housing now requires that we're using all these best practices, you know, going green construction and everything. So we got to go through a lot of hoops. If you want the money, you have to do that. So um, so when it comes to affordable housing, I think it's important to, to point out that we're having to do that. I mean, we're doing these big, huge, major bioswales. We have to re retain our water and let it percolate on site. So like the first month, you know, you won't see anything, you know, going vertical, it's all digging big, huge holes. And then we're using a lot of pretty sophisticated systems because there's these basically incentives. If you want the money, you've got to do these best practices. So I want to make sure everybody realizes when affordable housing is being presented to you, you know, we're the ones that are really leading the charge and making sure that uh, we're, you know, conserving water and so forth and using all these green construction materials. Alfred, what does that do to pricing? What's it do? With? Yeah, what's it do to housing prices? Oh man, I don't especially if you did uh, rainwater systems and dual plumbing and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know the specifics to that, but what I can tell you right now, I know a few of my colleagues here in the room that uh, right now it's a combination of things that's leading to some very high construction costs. Uh, labor is one of the major issues that we're dealing with, and then uh, just materials. So, you know, anytime President Trump tweets about. Uh, you know, the tariffs and style all of a sudden, you know, our contractors are calling us up, hey, steel just went up, and guess what? It's 20% increase on that budget. So, um, you know, it, it adds, everything adds. Yeah. Um, and we have some elected officials, even developer fees, you know, those that are getting pretty high when I go to conferences at the national, at the national level and uh, let some of our colleagues in places like Montana know what we're paying in terms of developer fees. They like, just, they're in shock. You know, when I tell them about forty thousand to sixty thousand dollars per unit, it's like, what? For what? What do you get? And I ask them, well, how much do you pay? Well, five hundred bucks per unit. That's the difference. Yeah, and I think you're going to see more of that. I know uh, Landwatch is undertaking a study right now. What, what's the cost to build a house? What are the add-ons in terms of impact fees and development fees? We're going to go here and then over here. So, Dave, I wonder if you might clarify the types of water allocations we have within the ages of. Uh, to with the commercial versus the residential. 
And then if you mind, this is the second part of that question. Uh, there was a period of time in my brain, and maybe I've been in real estate too long, but uh, 30 years, uh, where we used to be able to interchange uh, some of the allocation from commercial to residential. And then there was a period of time where that was uh, stopped. So I'm wondering if you might comment on that. Yeah, in order to facilitate growth in a no water environment, the Monterey Peninsula has um, what we call water use credits or on-site water credit. Um, and it's really transferability that you're talking about. Right now, we, we'll tell a jurisdiction, here's how much water you have from 1993, or here's how much water you have from your local water project in PG and so forth. And then they can make that choice as allocated to commercial or to residential, and that's a land use decision at the city's level. Um, there is a different rate structure for commercial versus residential, but from the standpoint of trading a credit, so I've got some unused water capacity here at my laundromat, which I closed 10 years ago. I'd like to give it back to the city so you can reallocate it to either residential or other commercial uses. That's one of the- Time check, I'm 15 minutes left, to make sure you can Yeah, we're watching the clock. Yeah, yeah. time checker. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, the, the point being that in order to move forward in a water-constrained environment, you need the flexibility to move water around. You know, if you took the Monterey Peninsula and dropped it into the LA Department of Water and Power's service area, they wouldn't think twice about moving a half an acre foot from the edge of town near Compton and over near Culver City. Wouldn't think twice. We've been sued twice over trying to return water to a city's allocation so they could reallocate it a half a mile away. It's a peninsula problem. It's a, it's a frame of reference problem. But in order to do projects like this, that's the next step until you get a permanent water supply built, which might not be built for five to seven years at the current pace that's going on the peninsula. And so we want to make water transfers more possible. In the early 2000s, my board actually made it harder by saying, no, commercial can only go to commercial and residential can only go to residential. A water molecule doesn't care. And if you lose a large commercial business, like a fish packing business, and there's a credit sitting there that could go back to the city of Seaside, where they could reallocate it to an affordable housing project, that's what should happen. But we get fought tooth and nail over the CEQA aspects of moving that water. So we're trying to get back to that. Um, if it appears that the water supply project does not move forward in a start pivoting as soon as we can to start talking about next steps in terms yep. of maybe boiling down two or three potential action items. Yep, we'll so take the last question. Yeah. We'll you like need to. to. Um, I just, I want to make a comment uh, getting back to the conservation issue and so I'm a building contractor and for, I've been doing building contracting for over 30 years but for the last 20 years I've just been doing residential. And I just want to point out that um, even what's called the best practices now are far from the most efficient way to use water in a building. And there's all kinds of room to improve, to drive down the amount of water that's used to serve. Really what we're talking about is potable water or water that's fit to its purpose, whereas right now we use potable water to do everything, right? So there's all kinds of technology for reusing water more than once once it gets to the property. And then, which be an ex is, is currently, by and large, an expensive proposition, but even the way that pipes are routed in the house and the amount of time it takes for hot water to get to the spigot and the amount of water that runs through a house for the different purposes is, in terms of what's allowed by code versus technologically what could work and the amount of water you'd end up using in a building as a result, we're so far away from being to the edge of what could be done very, very inexpensively through conservation by building buildings correctly that um, I don't know, I'm, I have no way of knowing on a macro level how much of the total water supply needed that, uh, uh, you know, what percent of the total water supply that is. I do know though that per other parameters that the state is looking at in terms of reading its, reaching its climate goals, that if we're gonna reach the state's climate goals, we're gonna be obliged to go back into a, a huge amount of building stock and change it to make it to drive down energy use. And at the same time, very inexpensively, you could make those changes in the existing building stock to drive down the water use. So there's probably a, 
at least potentially, again, if you have political will and culture changes to the point where we actually do this, there, there, we don't. We're we talking about housing units or buildings and thinking of it as as they have a stock amount of water associated with them, and that's not really technologically the way it is. All buildings could use much less water. Well, and I think when you couple what you just said with the mayor's willingness to kind of wink a little bit at, hey, if we only need 10 acre feet, we know we're constrained, water constrained right now. This goes to the conservation offset program that SoCal Creek's doing, we're starting to do, um, we've done in a couple special cases like uh, Sunrise Assistant Living in Monterey, where if you know that you can actually produce savings through best practices, count the water that you're saving and say, look, we're going to use it anyway. Now we've saved it, and now it's available. So even though we're in a constrained setting, we know that there's not sufficient long-term water supply. If you do those building practices, and you do add a little bit of cost, um, but you save the water, then you free that water up. And that's one of the things that we're going to look at as water managers to carry us through to get some of these projects done until the big water supply is made available. So I think that's a, that's a very good point. And I think in terms of solutions and where to go with that, um, you know, I think a number of our local building officials would be very supportive of those kinds of changes, mm -hmm. but that's a building code change and the lobbying effort there is really with the public health officials and the environmental health departments mm -hmm. to get the, the water, the regulators of water quality for drinking water to really consider how to separate those systems internally within building structures. So it's a building code change that could be made, um, but that's where it really would be effective. Yeah, so I, I work with the Monterey County Health Department to install the only that I'm aware of gray water system inside a house to flush the toilets. And it's just, it's work. But that's an example of an expensive system. If, if uh, an example of an inexpensive system would be if the building code allowed for pipes that were less than a, a half inch in diameter, there's a lot of things that you could be pushing less water through, like as an example, waiting for hot water so that you don't burn a couple gallons of water waiting for hot water every time you do it. You, there's cheap, easy things to do to drive down those, those uses. That's a good idea. Great, well I'm gonna turn it over to Matt. I can tell you that the rest of the state isn't where we are. I was in San Diego this past week. Boy, what a great shower. It certainly wasn't two gallons per minute. <laughs> so I haven't thought about this completely, so I need your help still. Um, but just taking some broad stroke notes in terms of some of the, the headlines and areas that we were talking about. A lot of stuff came up right now. Thank you so for the rich discussion. We're just gonna hold on. Hold up. Come on, need another volunteer. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so kind. One more volunteer. Mr. Wizard. <laughs> Council member. Elect. You wanna stand over here, sir? <laughs> Alright, so we're gonna we're still talking. No, there's no order. There's no order around this stuff. So we just kind of put it against the wall, right, in terms of, of what we're talking about. The idea is to, to, to kind of do a first rough cut, right, of what could the next year's worth of work do. And specifically, this is kind of, I'm being a little selfish, helping me with our work plan and how I can maybe direct some of our team here over the next year. What should we work on with you all in partnership to move this forward? even a little bit, right? Because we're kind of stuck in the proverbial mud a little bit on this issue sometimes. Um, so we talked a lot about a lot of stuff. I did my first little rough cut of saying, okay, well, it seemed like there was kind of energy or flow where maybe there's an opportunity for some traction in some certain areas versus others. But the ones that I kind of highlighted seven areas just to start, but something around groundwater sustainability, right? There's a lot of effort there. None of us, maybe there are some experts here, but maybe there's one or so I'm going to go through it real quick and just say here are the seven. Let's start thinking in your head, maybe you have a headline of a one sentence task or action item or creating something or moving toward or doubling down on something that's already working, right? So let's start thinking about that right now. So groundwater sustainability, is there something there? The prioritization, allocation of the scarce resource that we have, maybe you have something already boiling, hold on to that for a second. Conservation measures, that's come up two or three times right now from various folks, different angles, contractor, etc. cetera. Um, something around new development, really capturing the moment here when we're talking about new development, when it does happen, 
creating those opportunities for, for um, learning from those and really pushing the envelope uh, every chance we get for the, when new development happens. Commercial, residential, a um, lot of effort there in terms of potentially looking at other models, other cities and districts, and um, not repeating the, the sins of the past. Uh, another one here is governance. The kind of most attractive thing we can seem like we have there, all the, the feet moves that we have, and maybe some, some bad uh, you know, things that, that folks uh, still uh, feel like we can maybe get through some of that, that governance piece. Is there something very specific that we can do? Is there something that maybe the next five to 10 years we have a bigger vision for? Maybe not, I don't know, but it seemed like everyone kind of nodded their heads like, yeah, that's a problem. But we don't know what to do, right? Maybe there's something there. The other one here was creativity for affordable housing. It seemed like, okay, the, the slash the wink and the nod thing that we had going on, I'm not gonna pass any judgment on that, Mr. Delgado. Um, but certainly there's, there's a lot of consensus that, you know, push has gotta give. And um, when it comes to affordable housing, particularly a 100% affordable housing projects, there seems to be a lot more support on making that happen, you know, with every way we can, and pushing the envelope on, on boundaries. So. Any takers in terms of any quick headlines, things that we can start writing down in terms of, of uh, any of these areas, even from Dave? Well, I, I still stand by what we talked about. We need to facilitate the movement of water, the counting of water, figure out how much you save, where you save it, and make it movable so that you can aggregate up enough water to do a project. Movable water credits. Yeah, water credits. When you say water, when you say project, are you talking about a specific type of project? Well, so until you get a permanent water supply, and that, not just on the peninsula, I mean, Santa Cruz is going through it, Maria Coast is going to go through it, um, you've got to be able to count the water you save and say, hey, we saved water, now I want to use it over here. And but that's for what? Is, is it affordable for, housing? For affordable. Okay, that's nice one. Make sure that's what you meant. Yeah, now I've got, I've got a little secret plan because the people... A cheese for project. <laughs> yeah, there you go, a cheese for project. Um, the, the two times we had pseudo for the movement of less than an acre foot of water was a very interesting outcome. I'm not sure the judge had the right framework when they wrote their opinion, but they said you need to look at the cumulative impact of all possible transfers of these little amounts of water and figure out what it means to the environment. My hope is to come back with an affordable housing project where we do the exact same thing and then say, in this case it was a Sierra Club, and say, okay, you're gonna sue over an affordable housing project. That would be the test that I'd like to see. All right, I'm not scared of attorneys. All right, something. So what about the wild idea of just having every district set aside um, water credits that they're just gonna say, these are for affordable units, whether, whether we need them in the next year or the next 10 years, we're going to set them aside. And, you know, if, if then there's going to be a, a moratorium on, on water credits, those are still there. And, and affordable housing units can depend that those are still going to be there for them. Is that kind of the same thing? Yeah, is that the same thing? Just another way of saying it. Well, like, well, no, it's like setting it aside when you have it. And on the peninsula, we did that. And then the six cities, once they ran through their allocation, came back and said, we need more water. You're sitting on this water for public benefit projects. That's what we called it at the time. Mm -hmm. And the hue and the cry was so loud, we redistributed the public benefit water. So, so somehow coming up with a, a policy or, or an initiative where we're very clear about the prioritization of future credits. Yeah, and, and I think you guys have to understand, water companies and water agencies are not supposed to be land use agencies. Right. Right. They're supposed to accommodate land use decisions. Economists in California are beginning to change their tune on that and say, no, you need to allocate scarce resources first and then make the land use decisions. So it's going to be changing a little bit, but it's hard, it's hard for me to hear people say, hey, you guys as water managers need to manage our land use decisions some of this stuff actually does. We don't want to be in that business. All right, we're almost at time frame. Okay, I know, <laughs> time check. Yeah. I know. We all decided to go, we all decided to go over time. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just, all right. So how about finding a way of, um, like actually creating a policy for all this wild digging that's going on? Because 
because, like you said, it's the Wild West. We have breweries digging them. We have home uh, developers digging them. Um, yeah, they have to find, they go through a permit process, but I've talked to water board members that didn't even know that was legal before we found one on my block being dug for 22 years. So, one, 22 holes. Well, in North Marina, they have the same issue with growers uh, accessing the deep aquifer. Yeah, but, but again, I mean, at what point do we let it go on so much that it's, it be, turns into the whole area into Swiss cheese. Um, it seems like there isn't enough knowledge out there or specific parameters to qualify. Who gets to dig well? Why? Does housing really come first or does a brewery come first? Just because you can brewery. <laughs> Just because you can afford to dig the well doesn't mean that you should have, you know, you should be, the, that should be the only reason why you get to dig the well. Okay, so we're going to put something on the table. It seems like it's, there's potential for it. We're not going to say yes or no right now. We're just kind of putting it on the table at this point. So yes, on the table. Thank you. Next. Yeah, what about using some of the conserved water, not using it all for another project, but actually using it to restore a completed water table? particularly with you know, facing climate change and whatnot. So maybe try to do some of that at the same time. So, is that, so it's restoration of the, yeah. of the water table? Yeah. Reducing withdrawals. <laughs> Reducing withdrawals? Well, I, mean, I was hearing that if we have somebody that is saving water, that we would use that for another project. And I'm saying maybe don't use it all for another project, but use some of it to replenish the water table. Yeah, so what we did in uh, Pacific Grove's case is we identified their total water savings was about 88 acre feet. And we said 15% has to be retired to the benefit of the river because the river's overdraft off the top. And then another 10% had to come to the district for public benefit projects to redo the yeah. of course, reserves. Also, it might fit into the, the sustainability as defined by the groundwater agency, the part of groundwater agency. That might fall for it. Allocation to replenish water table? Capture that sufficient? One of your bullet points there is um, about conservation, right? Yep. So something, if these are meant to be action items, something that you could do. I, I sure. just said I don't know how much actual volume you'll get by implementing different technological advances. And, but one could figure it out. If you, 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 an action item could be to do some kind of a study of if uh, you made that you always have to do sweeps instead of elbows so the water, hot water comes so much faster. You could probably figure out how much water you would save on aggregate if you did that on so many houses, say, and then push forward an uh, initiative where you try to use that saved water that you can demonstrate is, is being saved for affordable housing projects. If, because uh, Dave said that you have to get credit for saving water. You could do a study where you identify how much water you're saving if you were to change the building code to do these things and then go out and do it to say a thousand houses or a thousand buildings. Then you would know you would save a certain amount of water and be allowed to take the credit for that water. Does that I wonder if some of that's been happening already with like little, little, little toilets and other, other Right, but other what I'm saying is that there's a whole bunch yeah. more things that could be done that aren't in the building code now that would add to the amount of she's water. Maybe she's yeah. she's some, doing this already. Some of it's building code restricted, like rainwater arrangement for water used to be, and some of it's not. And so it'd be really cool to have a toolkit of what are like the basic, what we consider current best management practices, what's the emerging technology that's actually available to everybody right now that could be done, and then what are these potential next gen solutions, mm -hmm. and then what you're suggesting is like estimate some impacts for that exactly. project exactly. basis. But even if not, just understanding that toolkit um, and having developers, under, like dual plumbing is not expensive while you're doing, while you're building, it's expensive in retrofit. Rainwater storage can be expensive, so the costs are really uh, so, so kind of coming up with some of those things. So developers are really well versed in the way they can minimize, absolutely minimize the water use on their projects, and then also what code changes do we need to continue to push for, like we have in rainwater, like we have in rainwater. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, in Santa Cruz, one of the citizen panel five recommendations is increased conservation and you know, really putting these things into place, but they did not contemplate and let's count it and figure out how much we're saving then free some of that back up for other projects whereas Soquel Creek is doing that so Capitola will have that ability if you can offset and so I think the counting of the water saved and 
repurposing it is as important as saving it. Several people mentioned uh, for elected officials it would be easier if there were a handful of statewide sensible mandates. So the elected official could say, I know you'd like to reallocate this water, water credits that were for affordable housing, but unfortunately, there's a state regulation that says we can't reallocate affordable water units to commercial. I'm, only, you know, I'm not a water person, so I don't know if that's a sensible one or not, but I've heard the angst amongst the elected officials that a few sensible statewide things would make their lives easier. And their lives are hard, so I'd like to make it easier. So you're thinking about, there's, is there some kind of statewide mandate? Yeah, statewide? Uh, around, around a certain, uh, a limited number of key points, and my hot button would be around water credits for affordable housing. That some percentage of your water credits could be reallocated from affordable housing to commercial or to single family units or you know a handful of those kinds of things. It seems like a lot of these issues are state issues, like moving yeah. water credits. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, and it's, to moving water credits and it's coming. Well. It's coming. They, so, they just passed legislation and they're promulgating regs on water loss standards. Mm -hmm. So in, in the utility itself, so all the utilities will have to report demonstrate there was there were two bills last year that were fought pretty heavily by most of the cities and, uh, and the water agencies on mandatory conservation standards so the state is taking that activist role it's just kind of rolling out now so, so we're gonna, we're gonna probably wrap up in one or two more and then, uh, uh, <clears throat> my concern is the stormwater storage and how expensive it is and is it a way that the cities as a region can work together and finance one place to store it? Uh, you know, we can find wherever the best place is, but as individual cities, it would be too expensive. We don't have it where we're going. But is there some place on the peninsula or the region that will suffice? And I think that's something we should think about. Someone can research and. You've got Nacimiento, yeah. Lake San Antonio, and South County existing reservoirs which have a huge capacity, but I don't know, Sarah, if that would even feed into, I mean, outtakes from those reservoirs go down Salinas River, but I don't think that's going to necessarily be the solution. So the real storage opportunities on the peninsula are in the lakes, Roberts Lake, right. Laguna Grande, uh, Navy Lake, and the, the plan that I mentioned really looked at those really carefully. So I think there are opportunities for storage in small lakes. <coughs> Um, just not in the really large volume um, where it would make a big dent in our water supply. But we're saying that the research already exists and I don't have to worry about this one? I, I think <laughs> that uh, the, the elected officials <laughs> could really look at those projects and an opportunity to move them forward. Got it. Okay, great. So I'll leave that one on. Any, any more? One last thing. I just, the more I think about it, the, the less I think that residential and agricultural and industrial conservation measures are really going to solve it. So kind of at the same point, I would just like to maybe think of including um, large water projects, whether or not that means connecting small systems to larger systems that have um, more capacity for water treatment, uh, whether that means um, you know interlake tunnel for the reservoirs and identifying additional more reservoirs. I think we're going to we're going to need to catch literally every drop that comes from the sky yeah. and try to keep as much of that going into our aquifer while still allowing a nominal amount to you know supply the creeks and lakes and oceans so salmon can continue to exist and so forth. So I think um, there's gonna have to be some kind of large scale element. So so this unless there's something really burning that you really have really really have, really have to <laughs> Yes, I do. And, and it's about Roberts Lake, because when Dr. Rosemary Knights from Stanford did her whole study about uh, uh, resistivity and mapped this whole area for saltwater intrusion, Roberts Lake sends a plume of fresh water out into the, to the bay. We can recreate that in various areas of the region. I don't hear a lot of talk about Santa Cruz County, but they're doing that there. And thanks to those projects like College Lake and the farmer, Mr. Kelly, working with Resource Conservation District, capturing agricultural runoff. It's not going along the road. It, it will be captured and recharged. And thanks to that work, the saltwater intrusion has stopped in the Pajaro Valley. 
that's exciting news. And I think we've got to look to those good uh, levels of work and insist that it happen in other places. Regional solution where you save water a little bit here is the region. That's what we're here is the region. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Dave for leading the charge.